Hello everyone. Well, this is certainly a different Monday, Thursday worship. Normally we'd be gathering down in the fellowship hall together. About this time, Lois would be there getting uh, everything ready. She would be setting out the pickles and probably snitching one. Stella, she would be bringing her, her chicken, famous chicken hot dish. We here at Ballot and UMC just call it the, the Monday Thursday hot dish. Verlaine, she'd be making her homemade buns and bringing them. Lois would make her, her pretzel dessert, strawberry pretzel dessert. June would probably bring the broccoli salad. Betty Leversedge is in heaven now, but uh, Betty would always bring a salad of some sort. Nancy would bring a dessert. Everybody would pitch in and we would have a meal together. And uh, shortly after supper, the lights would dim and I'd light the candles and the fellowship hall would be darkened. And we would enter into a time of worship it just felt weird for me to be down there by myself tonight. And an empty basement would also be pretty, pretty echoey, I think. So I decided to film the video up here. It's not quite dark out yet, but I hope that you do enjoy our time of worship together. So as we move into a time of worship, I would ask that you would take a couple deep breaths. Perhaps if you have a candle at your table, if you would light your candle, get that ready. It doesn't have to be a white one, but white usually always symbolizes holiness to me and, and it helps for me to, to center in. And so let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we gather tonight, help us to remember where our table manners come from. As we recall the steps of this night, we let love guide our hearts and minds. Remind us that it is okay to feel the heaviness of this time, but also help us to hold fast to the resurrection promise in which we rest in as we wait for the sunrise of Easter. And so in your holy name we pray, amen. Well, tonight we celebrate the Passover that's what Jesus and his disciples were, were celebrating. It was his last Passover with, with them. You'll find that account in Exodus chapter 12. So I hope that you will go back and, and read that tonight at some point. I don't know about you, but I've been recalling the Passover just a little bit more than I normally do this Holy Week. We remember the plagues that God sent upon the Egyptians and including the last one was the death of all the firstborn sons. And Pharaoh's son, we know, was not spared from this. God told the Israelites to celebrate Passover by a table meal. We call it Seder. You saw that on my Facebook. And then marking their doorways with the blood of the lamb. That was their protection. It signified for God to pass over that house, that these people were God's people. So mark your doorways with the blood of the lamb. And if you couldn't finish everything at the table, if you couldn't finish your lamb, you were to bring it to the neighbors. And so nothing went to waste. It has just reminded me a little bit about what we're going through right now and how God is still providing in so many wonderful ways during all of this and how neighbors are, are sharing with neighbors during this lockdown, during this shelter in place that just got extended. It has both reminiscence of this Passover but it also has reminiscent of that night in, in the upper room, tomorrow night, actually, Good Friday after the crucifixion when the disciples go back to the upper room and, and they lock themselves away. 
Number one, out of fear, but number two, the Sabbath came. The Sabbath came too quickly, and so no one was allowed to go to and fro until the Sabbath was over. The single most powerful act of the New Testament, of course, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the single most powerful act of the Old Testament is the Exodus. Both remind us of God's mighty acts of deliverance. And so as we feel this tension of the COVID-19, don't forget about God's deliverance throughout all of history. We see that time and time again, how God has provided and how God has delivered his people through tough stuff. So as we gather around the table tonight, we remember times around the table together. Do you have some in your mind? Are you picturing some in your mind? I always remember special meals, of course, that I had growing up that my mom had has made. In fact, I just sat down this week and I, I sent her an Easter card and I wrote her a nice long letter and I thanked her for some of the special meals that she made, or special treats, and, and just how she always went out of her way to make things special. She doesn't have internet, and she's not internet savvy. My dad is. At, at 80, 85 years old, dad's pretty uh, internet savvy, and so even with Facebook. But I think mom feels a little left out, and so I sat down and, and wrote her a letter this week, thanking her. I also remember meals, of course, that my grandma made and my Auntie Barb, special holiday meals. And, and you know, my grandma would always, I'd come there on Fridays after school a lot, and grandma would always have special things. She had gone to the store earlier in the day and got all my favorite things. A lot of times we would go out for pizza before I went out with my friends. And I always picture my grandma standing in the, that little tiny kitchen the Main Street house in Laverne, and she'd be leaning on the kitchen sink, and she'd be looking out across the street, and nothing in particular, it was just the neighbor's house, and she wasn't being nosy. Years later, I figured out it was that she was just thinking, and, and she was praying. And I often found my Aunt Barb doing the same, and I find myself doing the same thing at the farm and at the parsonage. So on this night, Jesus sends his disciples on ahead to prepare for the Passover celebration. And so if you knew that this was going to be your last meal that you ever ate, what would you want to eat? So maybe in your, your comments under this video, you can let me know about the special meal that you prepared tonight. What did you choose? Um, I think after this, I'm going to order from Bellaton One Stop onion rings. Definitely going to order some onion rings. Um, probably a California burger to go with that. But would you have a steak? Would you order the porterhouse, make the porterhouse, or crab legs? or chicken and mashed potatoes, onion rings, a pizza, a cold beer, a glass of wine, a ginger ale, a Fanta orange. <laughs> what would you have? What did you have tonight? Here at Ballotin UMC, we would move into a time of sharing around the table. I would pass the microphone around and and uh, at first, you know, people are a little bit shy and they don't wanna share much. But after 12 years, I think they kind of got used to me a little bit. So we would share memories around the table. And every Monday, Thursday, you know, I think of people that used to be around that table and now are around Jesus's heavenly table. And I remember some of the things with tears in their eyes that they, they said that they were thankful for. And so during your time at the table tonight, after you viewed this video, I hope that you take a, a few minutes to say what you're thankful for, okay? As Jesus and the disciples sat down to eat at the table, there was already tension brewing, tension in the air. The disciples had been arguing about who was the greatest, 
We know that Judas had already gone to cut a deal with the religious leaders to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of, of silver. We watched last night as the men, the disciples, and others pitched a fit about the woman anointing Jesus with the expensive perfume. And I think honestly, it just, it made them angry that the woman thought about this incredible act of love be, before they did. And so they, they were jealous, which brings us to the next act of love. It was custom for the lowest person in the household to wash the feet of those who entered into a home, a servant, the lowest guy on the totem pole. We understand, of course, that the main mode of transportation was walking, and it was usually barefoot, or you might have a pair of, of sandals, but your feet got pretty, pretty dirty and pretty, pretty stinky, too. And so it was an act of service here when you entered the home to wash, wash feet. But it was also part of Levitical law. We've seen that, this um, ritual cleansing. We saw early on in Mark that the Pharisees got after Jesus for their, his disciples not washing hands before they ate. And it wasn't so much that it, uh, like a hygiene sort of thing. It was um, a law, an act of ritual cleansing. And so on this night, everyone forgot. They were so wrapped up in self that they forgot. Everyone except Jesus. And I can imagine him sitting there and listening to them just bickering back and forth and arguing about who's the greatest and thinking that they were all that and a bag of chips sort of talk, right? And since no one else bothered to stoop so low, our Jesus did. You'll find the account of the foot washing only in John's gospel. John is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are similar, some of the, the stories, but John is different. And so John 13 is where you'll find this tonight, and so I hope that you go and back and read that. But Monday in Latin means mandate means a command. And that's what Jesus is doing here. That's what he's telling the disciples. This is a, a new, new thing that I'm doing here with all of this, a new command to love one another as I have loved you. Love God first and then love everybody else. And you see the disciples, they had all forgotten their table manners on this night. Table, a table your table, an extension of my table to your table tonight. Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel, as you've heard me say, is my, my favorite gospel. But Luke chapter 22, it tells us, and, and only in Luke, do we see Jesus use two cups, two cups here in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, that night at the table. The first cup that Jesus uses is a, a cup of fellowship. And so that has wine in it too. And so go back and read that, but Jesus lifts that to the Father too and says, thank you, God. And he passes it around to share. And it's as if he's saying, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for loving me and I love you. So this first cup, is a cup of, of fellowship. The second cup is the one in which we are familiar with, this cup of suffering, this cup of suffering. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Pastor Mike from Victory Christian Church. Pastor Mike is one of my, my good friends and colleagues. And uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, you can find Victory Church on Victory Church Facebook page. Pastor Mike is going to talk about the cup, the cup uh, of suffering. And so I hope that you will tune in. I'm going to. So Mike will talk a little bit more about the cup of suffering. As we move into a time of Holy 
communion tonight. I just want to remind you that our Bishop Bruce O has granted us permission to do online uh, communion. Seems a little bit different, of course, I understand that it is. Um, but he also reminded us now is not the time to be the theological police. My words, not his, but he said pretty much the same thing. Now is a time for us to care for our people. And I know for some of you, this might have been the first time that you have really sat down and shared communion together in your homes, especially as a family. And I hope that you have found that it has brought you closer to one another and to God through all of this. I also need to remind you that you don't need to be a member of Ballotin UMC or United Methodist Church or any church to receive tonight. Have a piece of bread or crackers, um, grape juice, wine, even if you have water. Well, you can make it work, okay? And so I hope you've gathered the elements and so let me pray over them, okay? Let us pray. God, on this most holy night, as we gather around the table, help us to picture ourselves there with Jesus as he ushers in this new commandment and as he raises the bread and the cup and offers thanks to you and as he blesses and he breaks and he shares. We are feeling all the feels, and so we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice and wine. Make them be for us both the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until you come back for us, Lord Jesus, and we feast together at your heavenly table, all honor and power and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Dear friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this. Alleluia and amen. After they had shared in communion, they didn't call it communion, but after they had shared in the, this new, new covenant with this bread and, and cup, scripture tells us that Judas leaves the room. And each gospel tells that a little bit differently, but we know that's, that's when he left. So a reminder that Judas got in on the foot washing, and he got in on this the bread and cup, too. Jesus served him. Take note that Judas was present. And after this, Jesus and Peter have a little talk, don't they? You know, I can kind of hear Peter saying, well, what's Judas doing? That knothead, you know, he's leaving here, and he shouldn't be leaving. And Jesus probably just says, let him go. Peter got something to say to you, you know, and he he predicts that Peter's going to deny him. And Peter's like, no way. I'm not going to deny you, Lord. I'm right here. I'm, I'm your main man. I'm going to go with you, you know. He says, Peter, you're going to deny me not just once, but three times before the rooster crows. So as you're at the table, everybody do your best cockle doodle do. Cockle doodle doo around the table, okay? Cockle doodle doo! Cockle doodle doo! Cockle doodle doo! Bring it back in. Didn't your cockle doodle doo kind of hit you right here? Ugh. Because we know what that cockle doodle doo means. Huh? Every time I read that in scripture, so I hope you read that account tonight um, as you're going, going to bed. That cockle doodle doo gets me. 
And tomorrow morning, as you're just getting up, Peter will already have denied knowing Jesus, his Lord, three times. Think about that as you get out of bed tomorrow. <clears throat> the late great theologian Charles Spurgeon, I love his writings. He's that liquid prayers guy. He, the tears as, as liquid prayers, you've heard me talk about him. But Charles Spurgeon says that this act of love, this night, this act of love, everything from, you know, the, the foot washing to the bread and the cup to just the time to, together, this act of love, this breaking of the body, the shedding of the, the blood offers us what he calls a living room intimacy with God. A living room intimacy with our God. God is no longer this entity be behind this veiled curtain that has this divider. You know, it, it was only the priest that could go into the temple behind the holy of holies and offer sacrifices. So, you know, if you sinned, you had to give, you had first go buy that pigeon in the temple, pay some money for it, give it to the priest. He, he blessed it up and, and brought it to the altar for you. So your sin could be forgiven. Well, that is nullified now. Here is this living room intimacy with our God. How awesome is that? And it comes through Jesus. Jesus is God incarnate. That's a fancy word we, we hear at, at Christmas time, the incarnation. God made flesh in and through Jesus Christ. We have this availability now just to sit down and, and to talk with God and, and to share what is on our hearts. And my prayer is that if you haven't shared your heart with God for a long time, or maybe never, maybe now, tonight, you would do so. You would have the courage to do so. You don't have to pray a bunch of big fancy words. Those of you who've been joining in and watching the videos know that our jammers do the, hey God, it's us kids. I guarantee you they know how to pray. I guarantee you they bring me a whole list of prayers every Wednesday night that I write down in my book. And I guarantee you they will let me know if I forget to pray. It's their prayer. So just take some time and, and sit and say, you know, hey God, it's me. I'm here. And I know you're here too. I'm unsure of how to pray. But here's what I got on my heart. Here's what I got on my heart. And so pray, tell them what you need to say. Don't forget to thank him, okay? <coughs> I love you, God. Amen. That's all you got to do. Then only in John's Gospel, again, do we get all of these red letter chapters, 13 through 17. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, and if it's a red letter Bible, you'll see all of these red letters. I talked about this in a sermon um, a couple Sundays ago, that the shiny things uh, sermon. It's also called the farewell discourse. Jesus is talking and we aren't. That's the important thing to remember here. Jesus is talking when it's red letters and we aren't. It means be quiet and listen. In amongst these red letters is a passage that you might be familiar with. John 14, we hear that read at funerals a lot, John 14. And Jesus is talking about going away, but not to be troubled, not to be troubled. Now, if you were the disciples as Jesus was talking about going away, just when you thought he was going to save the day, wouldn't you be a little bit troubled? I know that I would. I think so. I know so. If I didn't know what I know, and even then, when I know that someone whom I love dearly is about to leave this earthly life for their heavenly one, I'm still a little troubled. How about you? So then what? 
Well, listen. Listen. That's what it tells us. Listen. That's what Jesus is saying here. He isn't saying that all of this stuff is going to be easy, losing people we love, or this life, or certainly has us uneasy these days with this COVID-19 stuff, right? When a month ago, it seemed like a world away, and here it is on our doorstep. Here it is, Holy Week, Monday, Thursday, and I'm sitting in my empty sanctuary, talking to you in your homes. Seemed like a world away a month ago. Thomas, <laughs> I just love Thomas, the disciple. He's the skeptic, you know, he's the skeptic. He sees things anal analytically. He's that sort of guy. He needs the proof. He says, Jesus, lay it out in front of me here because I have no idea what you're talking about, man. I don't get all this. So what are you saying? Red letters. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Red letters there in John 14. The red letters promise we won't go through the tough stuff alone. The Holy Spirit. Jesus also calls the Holy Spirit the comforter here, will be with us. This is part of that living room intimacy with God. Our God does not serve us crumbs. Our God serves us the full meal deal. And the full meal deal is offering up his son, his son's body and blood for us. That's the full meal deal right there. John's gospel has Jesus saying all of these things at, at, while they're still at the table. They're at the table here that night and all of these red letters. So you can picture yourself there in the upper room. I, I hope you have that picture of yourself there in the upper room with the candlelight and Jesus's voice is almost a whisper. This is the last time he's gonna be talking to his friends. He's got to get everything out that he wants to say, you know. After saying these things, those four words, after saying these things, all four of our Gospels use this phrase as sort of a, a scene change here. It's a scene change. It's now time to move from the upper room out into the garden. <clears throat> Before they leave, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, tells us that they sang a hymn, a psalm. A psalm, they used to sing excerpts from Psalms 113 to 118, called the Halle. So Jesus probably sang part of those psalms, Jesus and the disciples, before they, they left the room and they stepped out into the garden. So what song would you sing if you knew that it was the last song that you could sing? The Jammers, well, they have lots of favorites, lots of favorite songs. You know, I hope you're marking those on the Jam Facebook page, compiling the, the list here. I have lots of favorites. I love the old hymns, Blessed Assurance, Come Thou Fount, you know, is my favorite, of course. But I love the new stuff too. Blessed be the name. Um, just, just all of them. Usually at jam when you guys are being a little bit rowdy or something and I wanna, wanna center you in. Oftentimes, and I don't have a great voice. I have a soft voice. I'll usually start singing. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. He's my Savior. 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 And I will praise Him. I will praise him, I will praise him.
praise him. I will praise him. Alleluia. 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 Usually it gets a little bit quiet. Each of the Gospels tell us details of the garden. We know that Peter, James, and John fall asleep when Jesus asks them to stay awake. Well, they just had a meal. They just had some wine. And they just listened to Jesus preach. I know how you guys are. So, a lot of factors. Jesus goes on ahead to pray. And he goes back three times to check on them when they're falling asleep. Watch and pray, he says to them. Do you have some good friends who will watch and pray with you? I hope so. I have good friends who watch and pray with me both pastor friends and non-pastor friends. And they've been watching and praying with me during these days. And I hope that I have been there for them, watching and praying. So check in on your friends, okay? Jesus wasn't just praying here that night in, in the garden. He was praying, but he was also wrestling with Satan. He was wrestling with Satan. Scripture tells us that. Here is that next opportunity that Satan spoke about when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Remember, it says, and Satan, or the devil, left him until the next opportunity. Well, I'm sure there are opportunities along the way where the power of darkness, of course, followed Jesus. But here we see it. We see it in the garden that, of course, God is present, but so is Satan. Luke's gospel account of this, of course, is, is my favorite. It says that he was, Jesus was praying so intently, and he was so under so much duress, so much stress, that he was sweating droplets of blood. Luke's gospel tells us this. Luke is the physician, so, of course, he, he's going to give us a few more of those details. It's a physical condition, actually, um, when you're under that much duress that you just started sweating droplets of blood. Luke also tells us that then an angel came to minister to him. How beautiful is, is that? We remember that an angel ministered to him in the wilderness after the temptation. We remember when Elijah the prophet was on the run and scared for their life and, and he lays down and, and God just kill me now, he says. He's under so much stress with everything. We see that God provides. God provides food for him. But God also provides an angel to come and minister to him as well. The olive grove and the kiss. I want to get this in before we end tonight. The kiss. I've studied this in, in all four of our Gospels, and I hope that you figure this out a, a little bit, and I'm going, going to give you the answer. I asked you today on, on Facebook to read the accounts, and, and which one did you find that Jesus is stepping forward to receive the kiss? Only in John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have Jesus, or have, have Judas stepping towards Jesus, and Judas gives him the kiss. But John's different. John is the only place we see Jesus stepping forward to receive the kiss. He sees Judas coming for him. He already knows, and he steps forward, and he steps right into the heart of the storm. Judas plants the kiss. 
I wonder, how long did Judas know that was going to be the signal, the kiss? If you were here with me tonight, I would have some Hershey Kisses at your table. So every time you eat a Hershey Kiss, I hope you remember that, Judas's Kiss. Peter, we see, chops off an ear, gets a sword out and chops off an ear, pulls that sword from the, the guard and chops off his ear, and Jesus <laughs> magically heals it. Peter, put away the sword. We don't have time for that business. That's not how all of this is going to go down. Jesus goes willingly. He's led away willingly. Throughout the rest of the night here, we're going to see the, the, this ping pong match of, of trials. I think there's, there's three at least, possibly four. Between church and state, Jesus is going to get bounced back and forth between church and state because nobody, you see, wants to get their hands dirty. No one wants to get their hands dirty. In this time when all we are doing is washing our hands. And it's important that we do. But this hand washing is different here in our biblical text. Nobody wants to take ownership for killing Jesus. So as you read that account, I hope you'll think about that. Jesus is going to be beaten along the way. He's going to be spit on and mocked and, and flogged and, you know, just each gospel tells that differently. And Simon of Cyrene will make an appearance tomorrow and carrying, carrying the cross. Um, you can find some worksheets about Good Friday on our church, our church uh, website, www.ballotinumc.org, if you'd like a little more homework for tomorrow. But as you rest tonight, I hope you, that you will get out your Bible and do, do some reading in that before you go to bed and you'll just think about all the events of that are going on tonight. Know that heaven is at work behind the scenes in our biblical text and in your life, my life. All of this COVID-19 stuff, it's, it's scary. There, there's, you know, no doubt about it. As I was watching Governor Walz yesterday, I, I figured it would be extended, our shelter in place thing. And of course, we, we can't have worship until at least May, after May 10th here anyway, by our bishop's uh, mandate. But we might be in for kind of a long haul and, and certainly our world is different. Our world has changed. Our world will be different after this. Our gatherings will be different as we head into 